Jai Prabhupada. Hare Krishna Mahatma Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for joining today for this monk's podcast. My pleasure. It's been, you know, I have always been, I always found your articles on holistic development in our bhakti quite illuminating. You often take an angle which uh, I personally find quite helpful. And I used to read a lot of self-help books before I came to bhakti. Uh-huh. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so afterwards, I almost left them as mundane, but then I find that Uh often some of those principles are helpful and you are, you, I feel among the pioneers in integrating, uh, say self-help principles in the service of Krishna in the practice of Bhakti. So, I mean, I, I did it because I found it helping me personally. So it wasn't, it wasn't a deeply thought out process. It was just like, I, came across it out of interest and it was helping me. And I thought, well, I think devotees can appreciate this. And there was a big, as you know, there was a kind of a lack. Nobody was really doing that. And I thought, well, I'll do it if no one else is doing it. And so I kind of specialized in that because of the lack of it. It's a bit of an austerity. You know, we'd rather speak directly Bhagavatam and Leela, but still these things are important. So we do it. So uh, maybe since you, you brought this angle up that uh, that you yourself felt a need for it. So usually yes. the, the conception that many devotees have that just by say chanting Hare Krishna or practicing Bhakti, everything that we need will come for us. Say for example, yes, yes. Bhaktir Bhagavat there is yes. the quality, the, the verse in the Bhagavatam, it says yes. if you just are devoted to Krishna, then all good qualities will come. And if somebody is not devoted yes. to Krishna, what good qualities can they have? So this is used yes. sometimes in both ways. That one is, you know, whatever we need will come by the practice of bhakti. And those who are not practicing bhakti, what is there for us to learn from them? So even I have evolved yes. in my understanding that you know things are not that black and white. But I would like to hear yes. both your thoughts on this and maybe something from your own life journey also, if you would like to share. Hmm. Well, one thing that I think is very interesting is that sometimes you'll read something in Shastra, like what you just said, it's Shasti Bhakti Bhagavad Kinshana. If you have Bhakti, all good qualities will come. If you don't have Bhakti, you, you don't have any good qualities. And then you go out in the world, and then you see some devotees are struggling. They have issues with anger, or maybe with lust, or maybe with envy. And then you meet some non-devotees that see, to, seem to be a little better or have conquered those passions a little bit and you wonder why we'll say that according to this verse it doesn't make sense so when what i've learned is that when when what the shastra is saying doesn't line up with what you're seeing you have to broaden your understanding of the shastra to make it make sense right so beautiful yeah. Prabhupada said but Prabhupada said um, non-devotees may have good qualities, but they're all zero because they're not employed in Krishna service. So that expands the meaning. Do they not have any good qualities? The good qualities are just zeros because they're not employed in Krishna service. Do devotees have bad qualities? Yes, we're conditioned souls, but we're employing, we're trying to employ those bad qualities in Krishna service. So there's a one in front of it. So that's, that's one thing, you know, because otherwise, how is it? I, I can't deny this person here, oh, wait a minute. I want to I have to plug in my mic. It will sound better. Hare Krishna. Now it'll sound better. Yeah. So, you know, just that point that you, mm. the Shastra says this, and then you look at the world and say, wait a minute, it doesn't look like that. You know? So, so I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to make sense of that for devotees, because I think the point you made was that when somebody says that, it's like, well, this is what Shastra says, that this is how it is. And then I say, but wait a minute, you know, you know so-and-so Prabhu, he's having difficulty with lust or with anger, or he's very emotionally immature, or he's very unbalanced, or he, he's not very tolerant. Mm. It, and then the other thing, the other thing, yes, 
Okay, but I thought just by chanting the holy name, everything will come. Okay, but what holy name are you chanting? On what level? <laughs> You're chanting Nabhan Parad? No, it's not going to come. And, and then if I'm struggling with anger, with envy, with resentment and so forth, how am I going to get to Shudhanam unless I learn how to let that resentment go, control that anger, become more tolerant? So, yes. Okay, if I have shud hanam, yes. But then if I'm full of resentment and hatred and anger and envy, how am I going to get shud hanam? And, and yes, bhakti will help you transcend that. But does it mean if I could get help with some process or system to be able to work with that, that I should neglect it? No, I can employ that in bhakti. Then it becomes Krishna consciousness. Like I have a workshop on forgiveness. It just deals with letting go of resentment. And a lot of devotees who have been devotees for 30 years are holding on to resentment. I was like, why is that? And they come to my workshop and in two days they let it go. And that helps them in their bhakti. So shouldn't we do that? I gave them a system. Right? Okay, do A, B, C, and D and it will go. All right, it should have gone through bhakti, but I'm not on that level yet. And now that it's gone, it's helping my bhakti. That's my experience. Yes, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, reasonable and... Uh persuasive just a couple of thoughts that yes. when we talk about say one and zero the bhagavatam often or even our shastras describe people who are not devotees but who have good qualities say for example in the mahabharat we have karana he is charitable he is yes. he's a, he has a sense of honor so he sticks so there are people who have virtues also so Often, yeah. Bhagavat, you know, there is, Bhagavatam talks from a, there is a Vyavaharik and a Paramarthik. It's a practical way of looking at things and a transcendental way of looking at things. So the Bhagavatam may speak certain yes, things yes, more yes, from exactly. a Paramarthik perspective. So from an ultimate perspective, yes. uh, if somebody, something is not connected with Krishna, it is a zero. But from a practical perspective, it may be valuable. And uh, so yeah, we can... Like, just like... Just like when, Ra when Ravana was dying, and then Lord Rama, who did he send? Was it Lakshman or Bibishan? He said, go, go find out from Ravana his like, top secrets for management. He said, go find out. You know? And then Ravana said, you know, don't put off what's auspicious. Put off what's inauspicious. You know? So he was Rav Rama's enemy, but he recognized, no, he's a good manager. We could learn something from him. <laughs> and he was... He was he knew Shastra, he was a good musician, you know. Um, you can't deny that. It's just, it's just employed in the, with the wrong consciousness. That, that's the main point. And, yes. and then and you had mentioned, you know, but how, you know, well, Prabhupada said, don't read any other books. How could you learn anything from a non-devotee? Something that I found, and I bet you found this also, is sometimes when I've learned something from a non-devotee where they systematize things. Because in Bhagavatam, it's like spread out. And they're just studying one thing and they're systematizing and, you know, maybe it's the mind, the nature of the mind, the nature of thoughts. And, and then you study it and it has a lot of Vedic or Buddhist or psychological influence. And then you start to see, oh yeah, Bhagavatam says this, but it was, it was you know, the second canto, then the sixth canto, then a little bit in the CC and a little bit in Nectar of Instruction. And you start to see, they did see it as a whole. I only saw pieces. And then by learning from this person, the pieces were in one place. And I realized, no, that's all in our philosophy. So sometimes it's like that. You, you, it's funny, but you hear it from someone else to recognize what's in your own house. Have you had that experience? That's true. So true, actually. Say, for example, don't be judgmental or something like that. We'll see so many occasions, say, how Wali judged uh, Sugriva and he created a he thought that Sugri was a traitor and then that created a barrier. Mm -hmm. So there are many things which are there in scripture. You know, I read in one place that, you know, we have like, there is embodied knowledge, which is like a small circle. And then there's articulated knowledge. So articulated is what is put in words. So for example, when we are speaking English, we might be able to make out this person's English is what they're speaking is wrong. But which exact rule of grammar they are violating, we may not be able to articulate it in words. So okay. often our embodied knowledge is greater than our articulated knowledge. But what we know, we actually don't know unless it's articulated. 
so in a sense yes. in scripture there is a lot of knowledge that is embodied but as you said when we read some other some specific teachers who had written on that subject systematically then that becomes articulated and there are so many self help principles which we can see that are found in scripture or rather are already yeah. acted upon by the characters in scripture if for dealing with situations so that's when it wasn't until we under it wasn't until we understood that principle by learning it outside maybe about psychology and we say oh this is this is the problem do yodan has he's got this you know i need to be right you know and and um he can't listen to anybody because he's so attached and you know and you learn that okay this is a, a disease a psychological disease and then you go to duryodhan and and read rastra and you go oh oh my govinda that's exactly what this person was talking about how when you become attached your intelligence shuts down you can't hear you need to be right you get good advice and you reject it and oh they're doing it and i never noticed that because no one like you said articulated that as a a, a psychological defect and and defined it and categorized it and I, okay there it is then we could name it and say prabhu do you have this problem and say well uh, you know in psychology they call it this but we see dhritarashtra have this oh that's what it is it becomes clear so yes yeah, so that's very true that uh, when we quite often i have found that we are studying our tradition but still we are also products of our generation so of course yes. even i we are maybe significantly different generations but still we are products of modernity or say as the children of enlightenment as they say western enlightenment so yes. you know, there is a particular way we think and when things are presented from that perspective then we are able to connect better yes. with them and quite often the yes. self help principles because these are written by contemporary authors so they present those in a way that we can quickly understand and then we can discover it in scripture if it is not presented that way then to discover it in scripture becomes yeah. quite difficult yeah it, it's interesting and i and i'm sure some devotees might say well that's a fault on your part that you didn't see it in scripture and and maybe there's some truth to that but at the same time sometimes you have something valuable in your closet and until your friend comes and says do you know what you have in your closet this stone did anyone ever tell you I said no no one told me what is it oh it's a such and such sometimes um someone has to tell you and and then sometimes i think maybe you've thought this way also i think i'm so foolish i should have seen that i needed someone else to tell me i should have known that is right there in shastra but somehow or contextually it wasn't so evident but when they spoke about it within the context of a specific problem then it's like oh okay we speak that also you want to hear something really funny i i had done some self development study uh pretty deeply because i wanted to use it in my preaching and sometimes uh i there was a period of time i was attending bhakti vidya purna swami's classes and he was explaining the same thing i'm like where did he get this he was explaining the same thing exactly i said how he's talking about consciousness and the things they're talking about because he has such a vast knowledge of vedic literature and vedic psychology that he he got it out of that and, and you know that's what it takes a deep a deep knowledge and wisdom but i thought it was it was interesting because it was almost verbatim things these other teachers were saying and i thought okay this is interesting it, it's there and he got it maybe he got it from them i don't know maybe he studied buddhism i can't say but it was interesting to see how much he was articulating which was pretty much synonymous were almost verbatim with what they were saying yes and as far as reading other books another point could be that uh, chanak prabhupad ko chanakya who says that you can take gold even from a filthy place so if yeah. there is wisdom why not take it and if it is helpful yes then yeah you, you so, know when one of the i learned this when i was teaching forgiveness the, the first book i read on forgiveness when i decided i wanted to teach it other than prabhupad's books was a book by a christian author and he said that if you forgive it will propel you more into your spirituality even even if that's not your intention because once you remove that resentment because it's so toxic automatically 
it increases your Krishna consciousness. And I, he said, even if you're not trying, it happens. Mm -hmm. And so that made an impression on me because I could see there were a lot of things holding our Krishna consciousness back that we were conditioned by. It could be resentment. It could be anger, intolerance, envy. You know, we all have some big thing that we've been conditioned by. And if, you, if, you, if it's not moving because you're highly conditioned by it and you can go through a process that removes it, then you feel, oh, without that burden, without that toxicity, because that was very Thomistic, my Krishna consciousness is so much better. My, and my relationships are better. And I'm, I'm better able to work with authorities because I had a lot of conditioning around authorities and people cheating me in the past or, or parents who were heavy. And I worked through that. And now I can work better with my temple president, with my GBC, with my God brothers. I've, I've seen a lot of that. And so the result is very good. Better relationships with the devotees. You can't argue with that. And if you had to go through this process, someone may say, but why did you have to go through it? Well, in the ultimate end, look what I got from it. And maybe I, I just wasn't ready to do it any other way. And so I say, great. You didn't have to wait 10 years to better your relationships with, with devotees. You can... You did it in one weekend. Why not? Yes, that's true. Yeah, that, that's that, my experience. That's, that's true, actually. There's sometimes something just click, and then once the mind gets that's adjusted, true. you're able to move forward so much more positively. And uh, I, I have a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just thinking that maybe we can also have a more expansive understanding of bhakti. Bhakti is not just, say, doing ABC limbs. Now, Jeev Goswami talks about, say, five principal limbs of bhakti or 64 items of bhakti. That's one way of looking yes. at it. But then he also, no, not Jeev Goswami, Rupa Goswami. But the Rupa Goswami also says that a part of surrender is accepting what is favorable and avoiding that which is unfavorable. Yeah. Yes. So if something yes. like uh, reading some books is favorable, then that could also be included within the ambit of bhakti. So we are not really going outside of bhakti. We are just choosing what is favorable for bhakti and using it. Yeah, and then it would, it, would, it would also depend on the devotee, his level of maturity, his, his ability to digest that knowledge, because some of that knowledge comes with a little Mayavad impersonalism, as you know, mm -hmm. um, a little karma kanda, you know, you can do it yourself, you know, it's all up to you, take responsibility, and so there's a little karma kanda there, you know, so if, if you recognize it, and you're mature, then you can kind of navigate around that, pull the nectar, from the pile of poison and use it. And so that would be a caution for, for some devotees. Maybe they would get, you know, a little bit of the poison would come in. And one of the things that I did, because I knew that, I said, okay, I'll do the austerity and I'll pull the nectar out and I'll just give you the nectar in the classes so you don't have to read those books. You don't have to do that. Yes. So I, a lot of devotees appreciated that because, because I would tell them, they don't even know oh, some of what I'm teaching, I Krishnaized from other sources they don't know that because it just looks like krishna consciousness but i tell them and they appreciate it. oh that's nice thing. you did the tapasya so i don't have to but i want to tell you a story you're going to love this story we did a forgiveness course at the eco village long ago it must have been 10 years ago and there was a brahmachari there and we did an exercise and I forget exactly the exercise. The exercise was, it was probably this exercise. We ask a question, if you don't forgive, what excuse are you gonna make? Because we wanna look at your universal, your global excuses. Well, if I don't forgive, my excuse would be this. And he was having a hard time figuring it out, so I talked with him personally. And so we came, we came to understand that he was having bad relationships with devotees in the ashram. He could only have relationship with one or two, and he was very isolated. And you know what we found out? And this, this completely surprised him. He had no idea, although you would think it would be obvious. He was raised in a foster home and he was bullied. And in order to protect himself, he kept away from everybody because that was the only way he could protect himself from being bullied. And when he moved into the ashram, he did exactly the same thing. So he didn't have relationships with the devotees because he was afraid because of that experience. And I've seen things like this again and again and again. And until devotees become aware of it, they don't <laughs> hear it. And, and it would take someone like me who studied these books who could look and say, I think there's a problem here. 
from a past experience is conditioning your present experience and that's why you're having problems with relationships and if we could do something to help them get over that because we've studied this and the result is they have good relationships with the brahmacharis that's a tremendous help to them and i had to do the austerity of studying all these books which at some point i stopped reading because it was like okay i can't do this anymore it was an austerity but i did the austerity so i could talk to him and say i think this is the problem i think that's a great service personally and i've been rewarded with discovering many things like this that are not so obvious that a lot of devotees wouldn't know because they they would just throw shlokas at the problem and the problem doesn't need shlokas it needs a deeper understanding of the conditioning and why he's responding this way and how to overcome that yeah you have that experience also yes so definitely because sometimes uh, what are the identified problems say if somebody is getting angry or is getting uh, lusty you know that could be not just because of anger or lust being so much it is because one is lonely and so there is a expressed craving but there is a unexpressed yes. need below that or unexpressed wound and sometimes that wound and the yeah. the inner wound and the outer expression they are like a one to one correspondence but sometimes it is not sometimes one might be lonely yes. and because of that they go in for particular direction one might uh, so yes yes yeah. I, I definitely experienced this and as you said sometimes just throwing shlokas that is a very articulate very graphic way of putting it throwing shlokas yeah just do this more and then somehow it, it <laughs> so we had a we had a conference with the uh, educational ministry and they asked me to speak and i think i don't know if i titled this i think i titled it don't throw shlokas at emotional problems that was the title of the talk and it was based on this experience like what we're discussing it was based on my experience of of seeing devotees with emotional issues that aren't going to be solved with shlokas and the preacher not understanding the problem like you're saying you know the problem is not what it may appear oh bro the prabhu you just need to get up earlier and then it will solve the problem or you you need to chant five more rounds okay that's good advice but that's not that's not the medicine they need for that particular disease and i've seen it so many times i've seen many times situations in which a devotee who's he's trying to help a devotee but he doesn't under he doesn't have training like pastoral you know about pastoral counseling these these pastors are trained to deal with these emotional issues with the proper, proper tools and 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 uh, strategies rather than now i'm not saying that sometimes shlokas don't work don't get me wrong i'm not saying oh throw out all shlokas but sometimes there's a particular issue and it's not it's not a philosophical problem it's not an issue of faith it's a psychological problem and it requires a psychological solution not always but many times that when you throw slokas at the psychological solution mm -hmm. solution the result is okay they might feel better for a few days but it didn't address the pro problem it was like you know some inspiration some insight trying to see things differently but it, it didn't address that conditioning and then it comes back up yes yeah, so that's that's a good point that philosophical solutions for psychological problems so that may not work sometimes i try to explain you know, and i face this challenge when i am explaining to devotees so i say that just as like we have these three levels of reality body mind and soul so if somebody has a physical wound we don't as in your word throw yes. shlokas for solving physical for curing physical wounds yes so yes. just as like the body has its own reality and the body requires its own process of treatment similarly the mind has its own reality the mind is one level and the mind will require its own treatment we can't uh, as you said throw shlokas at that point so you know yeah yeah, yeah just recognizing yeah. the mind as a distinct level of reality similar to the body so just as the body can sustain wounds the mind can yes. sustain wounds also yes and that can that that actually helps to understand that i like this articulation the way you put it philosophy and psychology so there are two distinct things yes you're saying something to me yeah yeah well what is what is the problem like what you're saying is just isolate the problem and then once you know the problem you know 
know what medicine is it a physical problem is it a social problem is it an emotional problem is it a spiritual problem and then you can address it accordingly you know you must be aware now with the whole devotee care initiative that the talk now is we need to care physically emotionally socially and spiritually where in the beginning of the movement it was mostly spiritually and then recently i was reading my daughter was reading and i and i didn't pay attention where she was reading from and she was reading from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who mentioned social, mental, or emotional. Social, social mental, emotion, emotional, uh, physical, and spiritual. The whole being, you know, this is how we have to help devotees. And, and, and what we realize is if we only address one, it's not holistic. And we may not fully be caring for the devotees. So we address the spiritual, we give them the Bhakti Shastri, but we didn't take care of the social, the, the social environment is not good, or the, the emotional, as we're discussing, or the physical. So when we can take care of all of them, then that produces the greatest result. It's holistic. That's interesting. Now, how would we differentiate between social and emotional? They're quite related, isn't it? Most emotional pro problems are related with relationships. So in that sense, yeah. uh, how do we differentiate social and emotional? Um, Sometimes you like, yes, there is an overlap, but sometimes it may just be external environment of creating, of, of working to create better cultures within our temples where social, you know, where, where devotees are, are more mature in their social exchanges or, or they, they're provided the social interaction they need, you know, the proper, the right roommates or, or even the right service, the right environments. Oh. That, in which they'll in which they'll thrive sensitivity or it, or maybe it's the wrong temple this is not a healthy temple for them you know or or again maybe it's the wrong ashram and you're sensitive you know the devotee says i want to be brahmachari and, and you look at them and you say no this is not going to be good for you we can see so we're 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 looking for environments socially that would help them thrive based on their nature and that would also include Varna, their service, you know, I could, oh, I can see you're a, you're a musician. I think it would really be good if we engage you in more kirtan, you know, because you're so good and, and so forth. And then when the devotee does that, he's very inspired. So I find as, as leaders being sensitive to what other people need, you can see by their nature what they need. Uh, and, and being aware of maybe this devotee is being isolated. Maybe he's from, a, like, let's say, well, let's use an example of Chaupati, for example, and this devotee joins, but maybe he's from Assam and everyone else is, uh, you know, Delhi and Mumbai Walla, and he kind of doesn't fit in, and you see that. And so you start to help him make friends, and you start to tell the other devotees he's feeling a little isolated because, you know, Hindi is not his first language, and our city culture here is different. And so that kind of sensitivity, I think, is super important. Do you know that they did a study, and they, and they found the number one qualification of a person who would be considered a vibrant and healthy member of a team is their ability to empathize, is their ability to feel another person. So that in a situation like this, you would sense this devotee is having difficulty and you would, you would do something. Isn't that interesting? You wouldn't ignore it. You would notice it. And, and it, it came, it's, it's been coming up in the talks I've been giving on, on Black, um, Black Lives Matter, the sensitivity that non-Blacks have towards the struggles of Black people. A lot of times they don't notice it. Mm -hmm. And compassion means to notice and empathize with the suffering of others. It's in the Gita, like 620, 21, right? He knows suffering by comparison to his own suffering. So that's kind of how I see the social. It's your, your awareness of another person's suffering. It doesn't go unknown. And then your ability or your influence in some way to cater to that. And I've done that a lot. When I go to a temple and I see maybe the ashram is not a healthy place for older people or more educated people. And I see educated people wanting to move in the ashram. I talk to them. And you know what I'd say? I say, here's my number, here's my WhatsApp. If you have any trouble, write me. Because I anticipate it, they may have trouble 
you know, all the devotees are 20 years old. They're 35. They have a PhD. They're way more educated than these others. There, there could be a problem. And so I think that's important, you know, socially. Mm. At least that's how I see it. So I, I, it's quite clear. It means if it's a psychological problem, it will be more of a personal attitudinal shift or more of personal development that will be required. But yeah. when it's a social problem, maybe it's either the person has to change their social situation or yes. the social situation has to be changed to accommodate them. Yes. So it's a, yeah, I think that's quite clear now, the differentiation. And our, and our sensitivity to that, to that understanding, or, you know, you see yeah. somebody struggling. You know, a lot of times when a man is struggling, then they go to a different temple, a different service, and you see it's not working. And then you know <laughs> he's in the wrong ashram because nothing, nowhere he's going is working because it's not, that's not the problem. And if we don't notice that, if we don't understand that, then he spends years and years trying to solve his problem when it was actually just an ashram problem, not a Varna problem. Have you seen that? So now you're saying that, say going to a different temple is like addressing the Varna problem. Because in a different temple, he might have a different service and a different uh, environment. So that service and environment is yeah, yeah. the Varna issue. And uh, that's interesting. I never, I would, I thought of Varna more in terms of service. But I think service and service environment both matter. Yeah, because so even when, say, when that when that person is is like it's not solving the problem. Yeah. Then it's like no, you're in the wrong ashram. Or it could be, it could be he's a he's a grihastra that needs to be a vanaprast. You know, it it it's 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 something I see often. You're going here, you're going there, nothing's working. And, and the reason, well, you're just in the wrong ashram. Once you change the ashram, like oh, okay, now everything is settled down. And sometimes he may not understand that. And we may have to talk to him and say, this is your problem. No, no, I don't want to get married. No, you, you do. You just don't know it. It's you look at look at your life. Look what's going on. You're so unsettled because you're in the wrong ashram. So that's just something as leaders or all the devotees we need to be aware of because then we can make we can help them adjust. Otherwise it's like the same thing. You're throwing shlokas you're throwing the wrong medicine. This is not the medicine because you didn't understand the problem. You're throwing medicine for that problem. No, that's not the problem. He doesn't need to change his environment. He needs to change the ashram. We see this more in the West, maybe less in India you see it. Because most men need to be, in the West, need to be married. So we understand that. Most men need to be? In the, in the West, most men will want to get married or need to be married there. Yeah, okay. They find it more difficult to be brahmacharis. It's different in India. Yeah, I think India also, everybody has their nature, but it's possible that more, more, more people might be inclined for a, a, the renounced ashram than in the West. In fact, yeah, um, yes. from what I see that uh, for most people, in the, I think by default in the Western world, the renounced ashram is not practical for most people. In fact, mm. I, I could say that in the last seven, eight years when I've given classes, in the West, I have practically never used the word Brahmachari Ashram and Grahastha Ashram because that dichotomy is irrelevant for most people. Because most yeah. people are going to be Grahasthas only. It's true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's true. So, yes, uh, that one point you said that the um, capacity for empathy, which is what helps people to belong to a team. Yes. So now I would just like to ask a little bit more on that. Sometimes in the devotee community, uh, Actually, we might end up more with judgmentality rather than empathy. Yes. And uh, I have I was at an interfaith meeting in uh, DC. Uh, Anathama had organized that. So there, one of the representatives from Christianity was saying that often in religious communities with high moral standards, pe people actually feel more lonely than in the secular world. And recently, I was talking with one devotee who who got into a relationship with a non-devotee and everybody else, the whole devotee community was opposing this devotee. Don't get into this relationship. Uh -huh. and he wanted to get into that relationship. And then this devotee felt so judged and rejected. So this devotee is telling me that I don't feel that I'm valued as a human being. I'm valued yeah. only as a devotee. And if I cannot be a devotee as per their definitions, yeah. then I have no value at all. 
so i think sometimes for devotees our spiritual practices rather than addressing our emotional needs may actually accentuate our emotional needs and may make it make the emotional wounds worse sometimes we thought something? if if we, if if the devotees around us deal with us that way if they judge us they don't accept us uh, may shame us make us feel guilty for whatever reason yeah then that could that can be a huge problem the the um there's this very interesting story where during the time of ram a shudra was reading the vedas and he killed him and he said he said i heard this i first heard this story about a year ago and it really sparked my imagination because as you know oftentimes devotees misunderstand shastra uh, a little narrow fanatical and so forth and it backfires and it creates problems and then I was thinking, Lord Ram killed this person because if the Shastra got in his hands, he would misuse it. And I think this is a real liability. At least I see it now more than I've seen it before. I, at least I think of it now. It's a big liability that comes with distributing the Vedas, Bhagavatam, Gita, that now we're putting this knowledge in hands of people who have a huge capacity to misunderstand and misapply or utilize it for their personal agendas. And I think it's important to be aware of that in our communities. And when we see that, we catch it because criticism, judgmentalism, and so forth can accelerate in our communities because of our standards. And it's, it's very sad to see that, um, you know, you probably heard Prabhupada said if someone leaves, 50% our fault. And so... Hurry, if, if someone Prab leaves... If somebody leaves this gun, fifty percent their fault, fifty percent our fault. And and if we and as Prabhupada said, you know, we it, it's so rare and it's so difficult to get someone to become a devotee. And then if because of us they leave because they feel unwelcome or unaccepted. Um, it's I feel it's like it's it's it there couldn't be a greater disservice to Srila Prabhupada than to push someone away because of being critical or judgmental towards them. And so it's something we as individuals have to be aware of, that, that, that when we join a religious movement, there's a tendency to be judgmental because now you have things to judge people by that you didn't have before you were a devotee, isn't it? You got a whole list here to judge people. What time do you get up? Do you eat onions? And, you ate garlic today. Oh, that's like horrible, you know? What about all the people eating meat? You know, oh, forget that. You ate garlic. You know. So, you know, okay, you shouldn't. You shouldn't get up late. You shouldn't do these things, of course. But to shame people for that, how is that going to help them? Uh, and like you were saying, a lot of times what people need is empathy. And for some devotees, it's hard to be empathetic because the devotee who's having the problem is going to reveal something that goes against our principles that he's not able to follow. And the devotee's going to you know, kind of spontaneously just want to fight back when that devotee needs to be heard and understood. That's the therapy for that devotee. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a big issue of devotee care, us being able to listen without judgment so the devotee can process what's going on and be heard. You know, you know one of the number one reasons devotees leave is because they weren't heard. They Did you know that? They were not heard. Did you know that? Devotees, one of the main reasons they leave is because they couldn't express themselves without being judged. And they, they felt they would be shamed or kicked out of the ashram if they were honest about what was going on. That, that they created a culture like that. That is the worst thing we can do. And so we all have to be aware of that. I'm, I, I see, the, you know, our intention may be good, we want to help, we want to create standards, but at the same time, we may unknowingly be pushing people away or pushing people out. You agree? That's, yes, this is sobering, yeah. Devotees leave because they don't feel heard. And yeah. that is so true. And uh, quite often, the most, the biggest loneliness is not when we are physically alone, but when we are surrounded by people who don't understand us yes. and who don't even want to understand us. 
<laughs> so you know going back a little bit when you mentioned that ramayana story that is yes. uh, quite a uh, you could say insightful application yeah. of that story so you yeah. what we are saying is that say if devotees who get into authority positions if their if their mindset is something like a shudra then they could abuse that knowledge to beat down others yes, yes. Mm. yes definitely yes. shame yes. others manipulate others or who knows you know what crazy ideas they can come up with this is what prabhupada said and you come up with the completely wrong understanding of prabhupada's desire or mood and especially us as prabhupada disciples we live with prabhupada we know his mood and sometimes we'll hear a devotee give a class and this is what prabhupada wants and we sit there and say no that's not what he wants he never dealt he he might have said this but he never carried it out the way you think it should be carried out so you have to be careful you know because sometimes you look at what prabhupada said and it seems the logical conclusion is to do a b and c but those at least of us who are prabhupada disciples no i said no he didn't do that he said that in class because that's the official official siddhanta but when he carried it out in relationships he didn't he didn't use it that you know in that absolute black and white way and that's important because if a if a person is black and white then they'll take whatever prabhupada says as black and white well that's it it's just this or that but no but i can't do this no you have to but if i do this i'll i'll become depressed no you have to that wasn't the way prabhupada dealt with it he wasn't that hard he was flexible that's amazing because this big the common problem which we are also facing in hermeneutics i'm a part of the shastrik advisory council so we work on the hermeneutics so one thing is that we have prabhupada's achar and we have his we could say his prachar but achar is how we behave prachar yes. is what he wrote so we have yes. a much more a uh, much more extensive documentation of what he wrote than what he did and yes quite often uh, if we try to apply what he wrote then that can backfire and sometimes some yes. devotees have the attitude that what prabhupad did or what he spoke you know that was only contextual but this is the standard and this is what we should be doing but then yeah. that standard also has to apply it in some context and we have to consider that context yeah i i find it just the opposite i find that in in my endeavor to understand prabhupada i always look for how he applied it what was the context how did he do it i find that the most edifying because if if you read what he says it's kind of it's kind of like i look at it like here's the shastra here's the siddhanta prabhupada is representing that siddhanta but how did that translate into his dealings his preaching his relationship with non devotees his relationship with devotees how he dealt with his family i find those the most edifying because you know like, like the women's issue the women say okay prabhupad says women are less intelligent women this or that but look at how he dealt with women he never dealt with them that way so why was he saying well that's what it says in the shastra of course there's a contextual understanding that would need to be explained but at the same time prabhupada's representing the shastra or quoting chanaka pandit or quoting manu well that's his duty as a guru to represent it but then you see his personal dealings he's also a person and he's dealing with his disciples prabhupada women are women are less intelligent he said no now i see that the women in our movement are more intelligent than men he said that you know one time so what where did that come from what does that mean you know so he like he turns on hit on the head everything he said or or probably my wife's more advanced than me okay you can listen to her so um you you can't ignore those things and just say no but he but this is what he said in shastra so i think um for me that's just my personal the way i personally try to understand probably is is through the application how was he dealing with it the context because my understanding of him as the acharya his duty is to represent the disciplic succession in terms of the siddhanta but now he takes that siddhanta here's a whole movement he starts applying that 
that's where the rubber hits the road. That's to go, oh, now Prabhupada said you're not the body. So now, you know, Brahmananda's in Pakistan and Prabhupada thinks Brahmananda has been shot because that was the news. You know the story? Yeah. Prabhupada, during the, during the, the war in Pakistan, Brahmananda was there and there was a, a newspaper article that said two American devotees were shot and Prabhupada was really, he was really, he thought, Brahmananda was like, you know, his right hand. And he thought Brahmananda was shot and it really affected him. And, but he wasn't. And Brahmananda got out of Pakistan and showed up and as soon as Prabhupada saw him, he embraced him. Brahmananda, you're so real emotions to say, well, if you're not the body, why would Prabhupada feel that way? It's like we want to make Prabhupada a robot, you know? But you understand what I'm saying. You can say, well, you're not the body, you don't lament for the, you know. So if you take it like within this black and white narrow context, you could dehumanize everybody. No, this philosophy, this is supposed to, how you're supposed to feel. No, it's natural. You lost a disciple. He got killed in the preaching field in your service. You, you don't, I don't feel anything. I'm, I'm self-realized. So, you know, of course, that's immature to think that way. But if you take everything Prabhupada said, it's very easy to take some things in that narrow context and misapply it. At least that's, that's personally how I edify myself in trying to understand Prabhupada's teachings is really pay attention to how he was applying them and how flexible he was and how sometimes he would say, yeah, that's what Shastra says, but this situation is different. I'm like, oh, okay. There's a lesson there, right? Mm -hmm. The time, place, circumstance lesson. You know, he was, he was willing to throw this out because like you're saying, what's favorable for Krishna consciousness, because this is not favorable for Krishna consciousness, he was willing to throw that out. Yeah, he threw it out. Oh, interesting. Okay, what does it mean? So I think that's super important. And I think if we lose sight of that, we're going to run into problems and fanaticism can develop and it can affect relationships. And, um, you know, that judgmental thing comes in, you know. So at least that's my... That's my personal experience. Beautiful. What you said about Prabhupada oh, throwing some things out. You know, that, that Prabhupada said actually that women are, now I'm finding women are more intelligent than men. There's a yeah. book like one, that. one letter. There was another thing. He actually wanted Jamuna to be GBC. Yeah, I have heard. So that. people say, people say, well, probably. Prabhupada never appointed any women, but he actually did. But then they'll say, well, you know, but he didn't because she never became GBC. But the reason is because the men wouldn't accept it. Not that she wasn't qualified, but the men were, were their egos are too big to accept a woman, you know, as part of their team. So it was their immaturity. It wasn't the, her fault or it wasn't that Prabhupada didn't see that there was a place for women. So, you know, if you don't understand these things, you just know, you know, women less intelligent, they shouldn't be leaders. You know, Prabhupada didn't think Indira Gandhi should be the president, you know, prime minister. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it's like if you have personal agendas, then you look at the philosophy according to your agendas to make your point. So, you you know, you've, yeah. you've already come to your conclusion before you've even studied the situation. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, that's true. You know, of course, I mean, it might not have been ego also. It could just be that if everybody else is a, in the management team is males, then having a female could create a certain level of discomfort and devotees might feel, let's avoid that. So we don't know exactly yeah. why it might have happened. But yes, I, uh, I, that's a valid point. Well, being, being a devotee, being, joining the movement at 19 and being a man, I would, if I had to bet my money, I would say it was because of false ego. <laughs> really? Because <laughs> they're all 20 years old, you know? <laughs> That's where I would place my bet. You know, oh, okay. what you say is, gen is generous, and it is true socially, you know. But when push comes to shove, I think if you ask those men who are around them, they'd probably say, yeah, we were just, you know, men who thought we were better than women. But here's another important point. A problem for ISKCON is when you don't have representation from women, from juniors, from, from, from people born in the movement, from Indians and Africans and Chinese and Americans and Europeans. 
then you get a very lopsided view of what ISKCON is and what's going on in the world of ISKCON. So you need, you know, when you don't have women, you don't have young people, their points of view don't get represented within the management. So I think, you know, people may say, just men, just sannyasis, but it represents a very narrow point of view. And, and until you have more representation, it's like with Black Lives Matter, the world is starting to understand the world through the eyes of a black person. But we never heard, we didn't hear this, we've heard it, but we haven't heard it enough. So mm -hmm. it was only in ISKCON, maybe in the 90s, we started hearing in an organized way through the Vaishnavi ministry, what ISKCON is like for a woman. Because there were no women on the GVC to talk about it. In the early days of ISKCON, there was no representation of elderly people because there were no elderly people on the GBC. No one was talking about hospice and healthcare and so forth. There was a bunch of 20 year olds, right? Who's gonna talk about healthcare when you're 20? So that's a defect in, in at least in my opinion, of, of isolating representation from a broad demographic. You, you, you'll just, you just tend to represent your clan. You're a sannyasi you know, you're dealing with brahmacharis, you'll tend to predominantly represent their interest. That's interesting. So, I never thought of it this way that, see, generally, at least, uh, say, if we consider Eastern culture and Western culture, in the Eastern cultures, things are yeah. quite hierarchical. So, decisions are done by the elders of the city. So, decisions, so in that sense, yeah. uh, if you see the movement's hierarchy, that usually the top leaders are those who are the senior most. And the yes, idea yes. is those who are younger need to be represented for, from that traditional perspective that might seem yes. unnecessary or even uh, like an import from another culture. But I yes. think in the world we live today, everybody needs a voice. Yeah. It, you know, if it works the other way, fine. If, if the elders are so brahminical and so compassionate and so concerned and so empathetic that they can feel what's going on and they can understand and they talk to them and they listen to them and they can represent them, fine. But I don't see that ha happening enough. I see you actually have to have the people who can say, you know, if you listen to any of the conversations on Facebook about Black Life Matters with the Black devotees, it's very enlightening because you learn a lot about what's, what's going on in their world and how are you going to learn about it? You have to learn about it from them because most of us don't perceive it. We're either not close enough to it. It's, it's out of our world. We wouldn't imagine it's as bad as it doesn't seem as bad as it is until they start talking. And they go, oh, or we heard from the second generation how they were, were treated in school. We thought the school was great. We didn't know. And then we start hearing, oh, much worse than we thought. That's that's just the reality and that's why that representation i think is important at least that's my personal opinion yeah yeah and of course uh, one point is that when there is a tangible person who acts like a bridge between say the second generation and the leadership then it's better than rather than having just like a you could say disembodied complaint uh, if there is a trustworthy yeah, yeah. link then it works much better yeah, yeah. yeah. So that works fine. Any way that any, and that goes back to my original point of, of the social, where we're sensitive to the needs of minorities, the needs of people who don't have a voice. And that's all, that's like a perennial problem, you know, the needs of the people without a voice. I'll give you an example. Well, I was talking about with one of my god sisters about problems with w women that she still has in, in her particular service. And I say, you need, to, you need to talk up more about this. And she said, no, you need to talk about it. The men have to talk about it. And it hit me deeply. I said, it's true, because sometimes the strongest voice for a minority is not the minority, it's the majority. It's the people who have the voice, who have the power. And that's where the compassion comes in. So I've um, I tend to be a voice often for minorities, and I've even been criticized as a feminist, which I thought was a compliment, because I was just trying to bring to light some of the issues and the pejorative views and terminology used with women and the realities uh, to light and, and, and try to encourage women not to buy into this idea that 
you're something less because it's disempowering. And I've been accused of being a feminist. And I, and, and I had to look up what a feminist was, I didn't know. And then I took it as a compliment. Represent, I was representing a minority whose voice I felt needed to be heard. And I thought, oh, okay, that's good. You know, I'm guilty of, of a good crime, I think. <laughs> guilty so of I think that's really important. I think Bhakti Tirtha Swami was a voice. He was a voice from the minority. I want to tell you something. You'll find this interesting. When I was a very young devotee, I used to like distributing to black people in black neighborhoods. And when we would go out in the early days, we would go out in dhotis and shaved heads. And most Americans had never seen that in Tilak. Very strange. We would get a lot of strange looks. Sometimes people would make fun of us. Doors would you go whole house to house, doors would slam in our face. We'd approach people to get out of here. All of this. And I went to the black neighborhoods. I got a hundred percent, a hundred percent, never, ever in my life did a black person ever say anything prejudicial to me. Never, at least in those days. I don't know about now because I haven't gone out in those neighborhoods, maybe in the last 30 years. But when I was going out, because they were treated that way, they never treated me that way. Ever, never, not one of them. I was like, this is, in, this is very interesting, right? But the white people would treat us that way. The, Mexican, the Mexicans also, very rarely, they would, they would treat us that way. They were very sympathetic because they were a minority and they, and they knew, you know, like when you're poor, you sympathize with the poor. So it's interesting. It's interesting to see these things, you know. And so the, the black people have been have been in a difficult position and they didn't treat me that way because they knew what it's like to be a minority. So in a sense, as a brahmachari in the early days of ISKCON, I got to experience discrimination. I got to, exp I knew what it was like to some degree to be an African American because I was being treated as someone weird and strange and some minority. And um, then I could appreciate and, and maybe be a little more sensitive to their struggles. But, but if I hadn't had that experience, I may not even know what they're going through. Hmm. I think Prabhupada says in the Krishna book that you know, if somebody has been poor and then they become wealthy, then they yeah. often give charity because they know the pinprick of yes. poverty. Yeah. So yeah. now the Kuvera yeah. Mani Kriva story. Yes. Yeah. Very important. So totally. last point you said something about you were a brahmachari and then you were American. I didn't get that point. What were you saying by that? The um, in in the context of, of book distribution to the to the, no, the that's black people, book distribution to the African American uh, to the blacks and the mm -hmm. Latinos. Well, After that, at well, when, you, you know, uh, okay, look at it like this. I am a I am a white American college student in a good university from a educated fairly wealthy family, right? So some respect is there, right? People, you know, you're a white guy, you're going to a very good university. Hmm. So there's some respect there, you know? You can do a f a, some things, you have some intelligence, some respect, right? Now, I become a devotee, shave my head, put on what people think to be some kind of bed sheet and wear what they think is war paint. Shave my head look very strange. No one had shaved heads there. And now all of a sudden, nobody knows my background. I get judged by what they're seeing. And so I got the full experience of what it's like to be a minority. So I could then, I could relate to the black people, which was also one of the reasons I liked distributing books to them because they were so open. They would all open their doors. They would all take books and nobody would judge me. Nobody would say anything nasty. So, um, I, you know, it was a difficult experience, but it was, it was, I think it helped me in some ways become more sensitive and empathetic to the suffering of others. And uh, one, one of my disciples said, we were talking about this in, in a class, and she said, she said, I know people who have never experienced suffering and poverty, that they have no, they just, they're not sensitive to that world. It's just not part of their world. They don't know it. They can't imagine. Like most of us can't imagine what it's like to be hungry, go to bed hungry, because it never happened to us. 
but when you when you have that experience you want to do something you want to feed poor people if you've been sexually abused many of the sexually abused people they want to go out and help the others who've been sexually abused it's, it's natural but we as Vaishnavas as devotees even if we don't have that experience we have to, to learn how to develop how to see with that compassion and empathy and see the suffering where maybe it's out of our experience we start to say no maybe this person must be going through something difficult he's the only black person like you go let's say you went to a temple and it was all a bunch of white brahmacharis or maybe all a bunch of indian brahmacharis then a black devotee joins a black guy joins you think he's the only black person in this whole temple and not all the indians have good opinions of black people you immediately pick up on it and say okay i'm going to help him i'm going to help the culture here deal with this this could be a problem we have to be sensitive to these things i think That's a, that's a, I just want to go back to an earlier point when you said that Prabhupada said 50% uh, is our responsibility. That's quite a serious thing. I never heard this till now. My, yeah. Often the way I had heard it was that uh, if that person goes away and does something wrong, what they do, you will get the karma for that. So stop them from doing that wrong thing. But then that can make one even more judgmental instead of more compassionate. Yeah, so, I never heard that, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but what you're saying makes sense because quite often, I, I remember Ravindra Sarup writes in one of his articles, I think the cure of the soul, that is some devotee would go away, that all the other devotees would come together and have a collective fault finding session. Oh, you know, he was sleeping in Japa, he was not doing this, he was eating too much. And because of that, all that devotee went away. So it is more like we pat ourselves on the back, we are all right, and that devotee was a bad devotee. So that can be very injurious for us as well as for them. Yeah. There's, um, there's a big problem we face is that when we become devotees, we're still basically who we were before we were devotees. And that change into a sadhu, from the non-sadhu position, the asadhu position, it's very gradual. And so these deeply engraved samskars of our conditioning and our nature, they, we have to be very careful if we're not aware of them and we're not trying to at least, at least not act them out. We can do disservice to people without even being aware of it, just kind of enacting this conditioned way that we respond to situations. And, you know, Prabhupada's asking us to respond in a different way. And it's not easy because, you know, in the seventh chapter in the purport, I forget which verse, maybe it was the 14th verse, Prabhupada said, as long until you're purely Krishna conscious, or until a higher stage of Krishna consciousness, you're basically a non-devotee, but that's your nature. You just have all this sadhana over it. And you got the doti and the korta and all that and the tilak. But basically, down at the core, it's like that conditioning of non-devotee is pretty strong. And so the, the, the thing we need to do is not, be, is not act out on that, control that, and, and align ourselves with what Prabhupada wants us to do in spite of that condition. And it can take decades and decades to just make a little advancement in overcoming that conditioning because it's so deeply rooted over so many lifetimes. And, and what I always think is said, this is, this is very serious because now we're in the garb of a sadhu and we're expected to be a certain way. And when we're not, it can hurt people because they're coming to us with faith that as sadhus, we will deal with them a certain way. And if we deal with them according to our conditioned side, even and unknowingly hurting them, it's such a disservice to them because they had faith in us that we would be a certain way. So it behooves us to be that way, even if it's just acting that way and inside we're not there yet, but at least we can act respectfully, even if we're arrogant. We can act in a cooperative way, even if we're arrogant, even if we think, well, oh, I'm right, everyone's wrong. At least we understand, that's my conditioned nature. I think I'm better than everybody. I always think I'm right. I have to be in control. Everyone has to do what I say. Okay, that's my conditioned nature. 
But now that I'm in the garb of a sadhu in a movement, that is the big black spot on the white sheet now. Whereas before it wasn't, I didn't have a white sheet, so nobody noticed it. But now it's on the white sheet. And, and so these are things we have to take seriously because we're representing an ideal of purity and people expect it. And Prabhupada expects it of us. Yeah. This is interesting. You are putting this uh, ideal of purity more in terms of how sensitively we behave. I have seen the exact yes. same verse uh, that you know, spot on a spot on a white white dhoti or white cloth used to justify judgmentality. Like if somebody has done something wrong, and you cannot do like this, and you bring the whole like a mountain down on them, so we could say yeah. that there is purity in terms of say certain certain impurities which you need to overcome. But an equally important virtue is, uh, is sensitivity or empathy. So now, yeah. we say that this is a, you now we have four regulative principles, but we don't really have empathy as a regulative principle. So, <laughs> so in that sense... Well, you know what it is. It's, it's compassion. It's, it's under the umbrella of compassion. Yeah. Because compassion, what part of compassion is like for Maharaj. You know, I'm happy. But I'm not happy that everyone else is suffering. Vasudev Dutta, what's your problem? Everyone's suffering. It, it, it's breaking my heart that people are suffering. And Prabhupada said, compassion is the foremost quality of the Vaishnava. It's what distinguishes him amongst all spiritualists. So, it, and you know what, what I found is the problem. I go out and preach, so I think I'm compassionate. It's kind of like a, you know, an umbrella. Like you just go out and preach and you're compassionate but you may not be empathetic. You may not feel the suffering of others. You may be lacking in actual compassion, but you kind of make, make believe you're compassionate because you do the activity of compassion, kind of like, like, okay, here's the standard activity. I go out, I preach in the universities, I give classes, I travel, I'm being, I do austerity, flying on the airplanes, doing all this. So I'm compassionate, no doubt, but that's not all there is to it there's a lot more it's a whole it has to be a holistic thing not just i do this and i get the rubber stamp compassionate if i'm not feeling and i'm not sensitive to the suffering of others there's something there's something wrong in my understanding that i'm compassionate because that's an essential aspect of compassion yeah it's so true we could be doing a compassionate action but our disposition may not be compassionate. Yeah, we are exactly. preaching, but we are, if you're judgmental, then instead of attracting, we may alienate people. Yes. Yeah. When you talk about compassion, I also it's thought a problem. That... Sorry? It's a problem. It's a pretty yeah. big problem. Yes. So, and I was talking about, thinking about this compassion, so we could say that no meat eating is an application. And we are often proud that we don't eat meat, so we, and we are quite condemnatory of people who eat meat. Yeah. But you know, we yes, may be yes. kind to animals, but you're not kind to human beings. You're not yes. kind to devotees. So yes. that, that, that sometimes looking at the positive side of the principle, not just the negative side, that the negative side is don't eat meat, but the positive side is be compassionate, be kind. So if yes. we focus on that principle, then it's quite a very broad application is there for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, and, and you articulated it very well. And that's, that's exactly what we need to do is articulate it so we can look at ourselves and say, do I suffer from this? Is this, and that's where it begins, awareness of these little subtle, subtle attitudes that are wrong. Or, or it, 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 there's so many things that could be wrong. You know? I'm not really compassionate. I'm just preaching because I want, to be recognized, or I want to take sannyas, or I want to become a guru someday, and have you know, like, so many agendas. You know, we have to be able to look at these things and say, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is not. This is not what it's supposed to be. And be honest enough. Like, have you ever heard that saying? Uh, it goes something like, you know, strong is the man who's not who doesn't run from his own reflection. Like, you can actually look at these things and say, oh this is, I'm honest enough to admit that this is a motive, this is a motive I have. I want to be recognized for what I'm doing. I want to be recognized for being compassionate. 
<laughs> you know, like it's like what a what a paradox. So you know, and and to be honest enough to admit it and say, okay, this is wrong. You know, like you know, or like, why am I doing this? Because it'll attract women. Like to be that that honest, right? Right. I'm doing this kirtan. Why? What's what's your motive? Well, I want to please Krishna. What else? Is there anything else in there? Is there anything else that's inspiring that? And to be honest enough to say, yeah, because I want to impress people. Oh, we have to be on that level. That's what Prabhupada expects of us, to, to root that out. Otherwise, if you don't recognize it, how are you going to root it out? Right? Yeah, that's true. Yes, right. So we're putting people in exalted positions, powerful positions. And it's it's incumbent on those people to be very to be very careful about their spirituality and and the higher you go up more compassionate you better be the more of a servant you better be otherwise you'll you'll misuse it you'll yeah. see oh i'm in it i have an advantage here i have power people will listen to me they'll do what i ask it's dangerous yes no. uh now, when we are talking about this, we are talking more about, a, you could say, a general attitudinal shift in the devotee community, especially in the leadership, or, or those who are in some influential position. Yes. So now, if we want to talk about, say, yes. if I say I'm an ordinary devotee in the community, and what can, if I feel yeah. I am unheard or my emotional needs are not met, then what can such a devotee do? Now you mentioned one thing earlier that say you have read books and then you make presentations, so which are which uh, incorporate self-help principles in bhakti. So I also try to do that through my Gita daily and my other writings. Try to present uh, how these principles are to be lived and applied. So one thing we could say is that we try to find out uh, those devotees who are presenting things like this and maybe connect with them, learn from them, and apply so that we get our needs fulfilled. Are there any other things which you would recommend? What if a devotee feels emotionally unhealthy or emotionally sick or emotionally unheard? What could they do? I think, I think that the problem is sometimes they can't do much because we need a culture around them that would be able to serve their needs so all they could do is express i think there's a problem here in our community there's a lot of devotees that need to be heard and there's no one to talk to and there's a fear that if they're vulnerable they may be asked to leave the ashram or that it may be spread and other people will find out and so they could express that and i've been in uh dealing with brahmacharis in india where we had these discussions you know openly with the, the leaders of the ashram like how we are we're afraid to express our problems because we're, we're fearful we'll be asked to leave the ashram and we want to stay. And so sometimes they just have to bring that out in the open, that kind of discussion. But really it's more incumbent on the people who are leaders to create that environment where there's a safe environment. But the one thing I would say, and when people ask me to talk about devotee care, one of the things that I always say is we all have to learn empathic listening. Because if we're talking about care, one of the greatest forms of care is to provide a safe environment for a devotee to express themselves. Because unless they can express themselves, they keep that problem within themselves and that problem could start rotting away inside. So it's such a fantastic service. Dadati pratiganati guyam, guyam akati prichyati. That's part of that. Being able to listen to what's in a devotee's heart just so they can express it and get it off their chest so they don't have to hold it in because it can destroy them if they hold it in. So I would say for all of us, we need to learn that. We need to learn how to do that and offer that as a service to everyone without judgment, a place where they can come and talk. And, and you know, and I know when we do that, it's so therapeutic for that devotee because they could express themselves. They got it off their chest and they weren't judged. They were made to feel like, oh, you're okay. That's, there's nothing wrong with you. That's, that's the normal challenge that a devotee goes through. So in answering your question, sometimes 
the answer is that everyone else has to be that way so this devotee has a place to go and if he doesn't have a place to go and he's a young devotee he doesn't have a voice it's a big challenge and all he can do is express that we need this but there's no guarantee that it's going to change the culture and that's unfortunate so i think it goes back to my other point as we go up and we see these problems it's more incumbent upon us to change the culture so this young devotee won't have to fend for himself and try to fight to be able to express himself in a way that he can be heard without judgment and not asked to leave the ashram. But when that's not the culture, he just, he's just quiet. And he can't do anything because he's afraid. Isn't it? You have that experience? Absolutely. You're in the yeah. ashram for so many years. Mm. I think- So you must know this. Yeah. Of course, I think one, because of the social, uh, because of the digital media available now, social media, there are, even if a devotee is physically in one place where they don't find like-minded association, they can connect elsewhere. And even if they don't have immediately over there, they can get it elsewhere. So I found that because I was quite intellectual and I had, I used to get certain kind of questions, which most devotees would find very strange. Why are you asking questions like this? But then I had to connect at an international level with, devotees who are more intellectually oriented and i, I found uh -huh, right. peace by that i think i found uh, that understanding that empathy so because if so you guys get some philosophical doubt and immediately you get labeled as a doubter then it becomes a problem but so maybe that could be one thing yeah. that find like-minded association elsewhere even if we can't physically relocate at least uh, yeah. can connect digitally with people mm. yeah that's a good point yeah. I mean, there's always, there's always something you can do, for sure. Yeah, it's true. But it's better that whatever it is has to be done is facilitated. That would be ideal, rather than you having to go look for it. But it's true. There's a lot. Uh, lots of devotees are attending lots of classes around the world because there's so many classes. And it's, just, it's, it's you know, every preacher has a different style, different topics, and people find... The preachers that they like that inspire them so that's great that's a great event mm. all glories to zoom <laughs> all glories to Krishna's zoom. <laughs> arm up inspires zoom <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful way of putting it mm. yeah also going back to your earlier point that you said that you did the austerity of reading those books and presenting i felt that yes. as our movement advances you know within our movement itself we need to create resources by which various needs of devotees can be served. Say, for example, yes. I was interested in scientific outreach. So I can read books about existence of God or existence of soul, which are written by maybe Christians or uh, secular authors. But if some devotees yes. have written it, then it becomes easier for us to access and uh, utilize yes. it. Yeah. So yeah. I think yeah. more and more Christians have done this to quite a large extent. The Christian self-help yeah. is a huge genre. But I could say yeah. that bhakti self-help, maybe because we are still a new movement, we're still a young movement. Uh, our tradition is old, yeah. but our movement is new. So maybe we need to create more resources like that. Yeah, we do. My, the, my last book called Living the Wisdom of Bhakti, which is available on Amazon, Living the Wisdom of Bhakti, on Kindle or Hardbound, is, um, it's a self-help book. It's a bhakti self-help book. And right in the introduction, I explain this is the first bhakti self-help book that I know of. And almost, I would say, two-thirds of the chapters have exercises. After you read it, this is how you apply it. You ask yourself these questions and you contemplate this way. So I really, I really felt the need for that and took it to that level. And I've gotten very good feedback because it's, it's taking the knowledge and saying, okay, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to apply this? How does this apply to your life? And how are you going to reflect on that if you have this problem and how do you have it? And what, what are three steps you can do to deal with it? I think that's, that's the self-help work. It's action. It's taking philosophy and putting it into it. Now, how are you going to take this out into the world? Right? A simple question. How are you going to apply it? So it's a simple question, but so powerful. And we need more books like this for sure. Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. Now, there is 
also i feel maybe some danger that we might get so caught in self help that we might that might divert us from bhakti it's uh, so yeah. are there yeah. some cautions which you would recommend because sometimes we can go into psychoanalyzing and that can just yeah, yeah. get get lost in the past we don't want to do that also or because this happened to me in the yeah. past that's why i did this so are there some boundaries that could be defined for this yeah sometimes if, if a person has serious emotional issues it's probably better they go to a professional therapist um there are people that also delve into self help and they never help themselves because they have deeper issues that aren't being addressed and so they just go from like one book to another the same problem perpetuates itself because there's deeper issues and they may need professional help also what i found personally was that at a certain point it was occupying a lot of my time in reading and it has a different effect on my consciousness than reading prabhupada's books and i started to feel like okay i need to i need to stop reading this because i'm so interested in this i could read like every book i could read every psychology book and every self help book on you know that you could find in a bookstore and then when do i have time to read bhagavatam now so it was it, it for for me i got to a point where was, i was a little out of balance and like i was saying before what i was seeing in the world of self help there's this this undercurrent of karma kanda that it's just like you these are the 10 principles and if you follow these 10 you'll be successful and that's very karma kanda you know, you just do this you get this result it has nothing to do with god nothing to do with your past karma it just happens it just it's just your endeavor to be in the right mindset you know okay there's truth to that obviously but that's not the whole five factors to action so they take like two factors and they go this is everything endeavor and you know situation or something and then and then you'll be successful here's the 10 success principles so we have to keep that in mind that's very important otherwise it's totally it's like you don't need god for this and it's nothing about your karma it's just about your effort to your effort you automatically get this result to some degree true to some degree not true so i found that you know the karma kanda influence is quite strong in that you know and the lack of dependence on god prayer to god in that paradigm is kind of obvious unless you're getting it from like joe olstein or something or from a christian but when you go in the secular world the lack of empowerment dependence god giving intelligence it, they don't recognize that they just you know they'll do exercises where you'll get the intelligence but they don't recognize it's coming from him you know the the uh the process of of inquiring asking questions why do you do this what could you do better you know answering your own questions that's that's just that's activating super soul to guide you and they don't and you know you can active activate super soul in other ways through prayer through japa so they don't have that there and um akura you may know akura prabhu and he was saying you know he say I think he was once telling me he said you know prayer is a certain kind of goal setting because you're at you're bringing god into your goal setting this is my goal but i'm bringing prayer into it and i thought yeah this is beautiful you know so when you bring you start bringing krishna into it because they've kind of taken him out of it and just made formulas so i need to be aware of that you know it's like i don't need god i can just follow the 10 success principles no you need god it's not you know it's not just going to happen just because you do a b c and d it, there's more to it that's an amazing and even sometimes you don't do a b and c and you just put your hands up in the air yeah that's an amazing thought prayer that's, is that's also setting a goal yeah it is setting a goal yeah. acknowledging dependence acknowledging the need for help so it's interesting you're saying that uh, it's uh, any, that you can achieve in anything that you set your mind on that you are calling as karma kanda are you saying that more in the sense of karma mimamsa that you know if i work i get the results because karma kanda does involve some yeah, amount yeah, of yeah worship. yeah 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 i make karma mimamsa excuse me yeah karma you, you just so make I, the effort and you get the result yeah so there is there is truth to that but that's not the five factors they they leave out a few factors there you know 
the place, the endeavor. Yeah, okay, definitely, right? But what about the super soul? What about him? You know, what about karma? Um, it's not. Your you destiny know, is there. Our destiny is also there from the past. Yeah. Yeah. Karma. So at least two factors, you know, in the equation. So. And there's a lot of impersonalism in the world of self-help. You know, the universe will guide you. Okay, so we understand it's impersonal, but it's yeah. when you get around impersonal ideas, you have to be careful because they can rub off on you in mm -hmm. bad ways. That's, that's true. Even in Christianity, there is like Joel Austin, you mentioned, there are some conservative Christians who often even criticize him because they say he's an advocate of prosperity theology. So, yes, yes. so they said this is not actually a traditional Christianity, which is more of rejecting yeah. the world and focusing on God. So within it's true. So, yeah. So within our tradition also, I think uh, we need to be careful about what uh, spiritual self-help principles yeah. we incorporate. And uh, what are you going to use it for? Yeah. So chanting the holy name with the desire for material benefit is an offense to the holy name. Yeah, you know this. So then there is there are two. Maybe I, I'll conclude. We can conclude this with one important point. There is one aspect of uh, self gratification, and another aspect of you could say self development. Now self development will also give some gratification, but uh, there is a difference. Say for example, if somebody is a brahmana, or somebody is a vaishya then developing themselves in that way will give some satisfaction. And, yeah. but that is not the same as say sense gratification, as we say. So sometimes we differentiate yeah. between say material and spiritual, but I feel yeah. that, that that classification may not be adequate because within material, there could be simply something which is sensual and there could be something which is uh, varanic according to one's nature, sabhavik or so yeah. once according to yeah. varana or ashram nature. And so, so when we talk about yeah. somebody saying that, oh, you adopt the self-help principles, you'll gain wealth, you'll gain fame, you'll get power. But that would be more of a sensual thing, which we do not want to do. Yes. But the yes. aspect of developing ourselves and manifesting our talents, our abilities, uh, that is something which is very much according to our tradition. So that is what we need to do. Any thoughts on this? And, yeah, because we're doing it for Krishna, then we're safe. And otherwise, it's what's the point? Yeah. Yes. Um, and like you say, Swabhav. Um, what I what I found, I found a lot, lot of devotees. I didn't know this, but you know, I'd go to their house and see. They have all these books on self. And I go, well, this book really helped me. And I go, like, you're a devotee. This book changed my life. I'm like, really? You know? But they have a certain nature. And because they have a certain nature, that, that has helped them. And now it's helped them become better devotees. And they never used it to improve themselves so they could enjoy materially, but they used it to stabilize themselves, to improve relationships, to have better grihasta life, to be more successful materially, so they could um, not enjoy materially, but they could they could live a better life, which would free them to do more devotional service, things like that. And so that's natural for a devotee to think that way. That's how devotees think, you know, because that's what we're doing everything for. So I entered that study in that mood with the mood of, okay, all the devotees are probably not going to do this. I'll do it, and I'll give it to them. I'll take it, I'll repackage it, and I'll give it to them. I'll save them the tens of thousands of dollars I spent going to these seminars and the days and days, weeks and weeks of studying, and we'll repackage it in a Krishna conscious framework. And they can get it and they can see exactly how to use this. I use so many of these principles in my Japa workshop. You will see in my Japa workshop, I do things that nobody else does but it's all based on those principles and it's very effective and just adjusting the mind, adjusting consciousness, putting yourself in this mindset 
that can enable you to, to have much better japa. Just, just like positive expectation. Expect you're going to get mercy. Expect you'll chant good rounds. Expect it'll be relishable. And then all of a sudden it happens because that's the way the mind works. And because I know that, I can offer that to devotees. And I see, oh, that's good. It's good I learned that. And now we can apply it. And, it, and it's not a problem. It's just, it just works. It's, there's no, no fear you know, like, to even worry about that. It's just, it's just so aligned with what we're trying to do. So many of these things are just natural. Like we were talking earlier, they're naturally aligned with Krishna consciousness. It's not even a problem. It just fits right in. Nobody you know, has a problem with it. This is beautiful, expecting that we will, so it is, there is one aspect that being determined that I am going to chant attentively, but that, and we often focus on that aspect that be determined, but there is other aspect of expecting, yes, the Japa, Japa will be good, I will be able to connect with the holy name, that aspect is not talked about so much, so we focus more on well, the part, yeah. grace part is also there. It's, a, it's, um, it's, it's actually, if you look at it in the six principles of surrender, Krishna will always protect me. He'll always maintain me. It's an expectation. It's a, it's a vision. And what you find is what you expect tends to happen. And I've used this with devotees on the 64 round day who are frightened, who never chanted 64 rounds. I just said, envision that it's going to be sweet, going to be beautiful. Every round is going to be, each round will be better than the last. And they'd come to me and say, I had an amazing day. I, I couldn't believe that I did this, but because I anticipated, expected, I went to bed expecting it would be good. Just whole day, just folded out according to my expectation. I go, yeah, of course. I've studied this. I know how this works. This is the way psychology works. This is the way energy from the mind and heart work. It works against you all the time. I'm so worried this is going to happen. What happens? It happens, isn't it? You're on book distribution. He'll never take a book. What happens? He doesn't take it. <laughs> oh, this guy's going to take a book. You're into, what happens? He takes it. So, you know, it's just, it's, just applic it's just applying it in various circumstances. So I've used a lot of this in Japa, and it's had really a lot of benefit and a lot of what I'm teaching. It, it goes against a little bit of the grain of what some other people are teaching, but I have experience with this, and thousands and thousands of people around the world have experience with certain tools of consciousness that create certain results. So I just apply this because I just see it as a law. It's a, like a law of mental physics, mental energy. This is just how it works. And so I think, well, that's good. I made it easier for these devotees to chant 64 rounds. They had a great experience. So fantastic. Why not? Amazing. If I can offer that to the devotee world, okay, it's a contribution I can make. That may be unique in some way. I have to go. Yes, please. it's late for me. Yes, thank you very much for your time, and uh, it has been very illuminating. And I'm sure many devotees also find uh, this illuminating. And uh, your book you mentioned was the, uh, maybe if you can send me the link, I will put it in the YouTube description also, so that those who want, they okay. can get a copy of the book. Living the Wisdom of Bhakti. We have to find out, I just found out it's, it doesn't seem to be available on Amazon India, but it should be. So we'll, we'll make sure. And then um, my website, mahatmadas.com, Facebook, Mahatmadas, every morning at 8 a.m., which which would be like 5 30 p.m your time monday through friday we do classes and some other classes are listed on my facebook page we do a few more so they're all welcome to come and my website has tons of articles over, over maybe 100 articles and 500 hours of audio and about 34 different seminars on these kinds of topics that i feel are really important relevant so they're welcome to go there. And then we have a forgiveness course online. And the link is there on the website, where it's an official course with videos and exercises, not just a lecture, but it's the whole course. And we have two courses. And one of the course has 100 pages of materials. It's, it's a, an intensive course on forgiveness. So anyone needing to practically let go, these courses will do that.
It's a great resource and had a lot of good feedback from it. And it's, it's the course that I do live. We put it on in the online format. So that's nice. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. It's wonderful. My pleasure. The association. And maybe in future we could have a further discussion on some of the topics if we get some further questions based yeah. on what we discussed today. These are important topics. These are important topics. Okay. Love Thank to. you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Bhada. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. Go Premanan. Thank you.